All right, the four forces shown all have the same strength. From your experience, which force would be most effective in opening the door? In other words, which would open the door more easily or more quickly? Uh, which is the best way to apply this force to open the door? Hopefully your experience will tell you something like, it's not this one, because the one further away would be better, right? Pushing close to the hinge is less effective than pushing further away from the hinge. Uh, on the other hand, it's actually not going to be this one either, even though, oops, even though it is further away, because you're pushing, you're not pushing the door to the side either way. It doesn't, it doesn't tend to spin, it doesn't tend to open in any way. Um, and then we, so we're down to either one or three. And again, sort of in your experience, maybe you would notice it wouldn't be this one that pushing straight on the door is going to always be better than pushing at some slant. When you push at a slant, you're either pulling on or pushing on the hinge, which you don't really care about. You just want to rotate the door. All right. So our answer would be force F1 is the best. It's clear that forces can cause rotations, but it should also be clear that the concept of force is not enough by itself. In addition to the magnitude and direction of the force, we need to consider its placement. As a quick aside, that's sort of similar to how uh, in terms of rotational inertia, we need the mass. The mass is an important part of that, but it's not by itself. It's its placement of the mass that affects the, the rotational inertia. Likewise, the placement of the forces uh, affect how well they cause rotations. The rotational analog to force is called torque, and it's symbolized by the uh, Greek letter tau. Tau is sort of like a pie that has only one leg. Each force generates a torque, although it's possible for the value of that torque to be zero. Even when, the tor even when the force is not zero, the torque might be zero. Also, the torque generated depends on the point of rotation that we pick. Usually, it's pretty clear which point to pick. The location of the hinge or pivot or other device constra constraining that rotating object. If there isn't a constraint, then we'll see later, most often things will rotate around their center of mass um, if there's no other reason to hold them down. So uh, we'll come back to that and see that later, but it's important to see. And we'll also see that if the things are not actually rotating because the torques are imbalanced, then it doesn't really matter where you pick as your point. From our example from the door, we can see the torque is larger when the force is larger. That makes sense. And it's larger when the force is further from the pivot. That makes sense. But it's zero if the force points through or points away from the pivot itself. And the torque is maximal when the force points perpendicular to the line connecting it to the pivot. All right, that's all comes down to that F1 was our best force in that first example. Any force can be broken into components, one of which is along the line containing it to the pivot. So let's say we draw our door. And now I have some force. And I say, let's just draw it like that. Oops. And we know that we can break this into something which is parallel to the line connecting it to the pivot, F parallel, and perpendicular to the line, F perpendicular. And only F perpendicular exerts a non-zero torque. The part pushing into or out of the hinge doesn't cause rotation. The torque itself has a direction, which will be positive when a torque tends to rotate the object in a counterclockwise sense. Honestly, the best way to say it is that torque is positive if it tends to point in the if you're tending to rotate the object in the same direction as you're increasing theta, whatever you picked in your reference frame. How do we go about computing the f torque? There are a couple of different ways, um, sometimes a little clumsy, sometimes not. One is to do the following geometry. We might define something called the radial line, which is the line starting at the pivot running through Right, this line running through the force and then continuing on. And then the angle that we're using is the angle between the force and that radial line. Be careful geometrically because your eye is going to want to pick um, this angle. And that is not the right angle. Don't do that. That's not the correct angle. That, of course, would let us break up the force. And since we know that we need this component, which is also that, we can see that it's a sign that gets us there, that the main force times sine of the angle gives us the thing we're looking for, F perpendicular. It can sometimes be easier to geometrically deal with the lengths rather than 
breaking up the force. In this case, we're going to use what is basically uh, steampunk terminology, stuff really dating back almost 300 years at this point. Uh, we're going to say that we define something called the line of action, which is a line containing the force vector. So in this case, it's this line. And we define something called the moment arm, which is the shortest distance from the pivot to that line of action. So that's the moment arm. Moment arm is a terrible name. These are all terrible names because they're basically old. Um, but we're kind of stuck with it. If we do that, then it turns out that we can also say um, that the torque is that distance times F. We symbolize the moment arm as uh, with the symbol R perpendicular. Uh, because it's the dis the distance perpendicular to the line of axis axon, and then we can see that the same we get the same uh, geometry as before if we multiply like this. So we have sort of two direct ways of doing things, and then really both of them are trying to encapsulate this one, and you use whichever one is most convenient because they are equivalent. So to sum again, our magnitude for our torque is the distance times the perpendicular component of the force, or it's the perpendicular distance to the line of action times the whole force, or it's the whole distance times the whole force times the sine of the angle between them. Where again, um, F and that, and this is theta. The units of torque we can see right here are meters times newtons. It's always written as newton dot meter because we don't want anyone to think we, have, we mean millinewtons. So it's always written as n times m. And the sharp among you might notice that these are the same as units as for energy, but no one ever writes joules as a unit of torque. Right? There is no abbreviation for the unit of torque. It's just meter newtons of torque. Uh, that has a curious correspondence in the British system where the unit of torque is the foot-pound and the unit of energy is the pound-foot, and they're considered to be separate and distinct, even though they're not really. All right, so here, just draw the line of action for this force using a dashed line. It is traditional to use the dashed lines, although not necessary. Remember, the line of action is the line in which the force vector lives, the line containing the force vector, so we really just extend it in both directions, and that would be our line of action. Drawn a little bit more precisely, but the same idea. Given that line of action, draw the moment arm for this force, which we usually do as a solid line, though again, you don't have to. And the moment arm is the shortest distance between, the, sh the shortest line segment connecting the pivot to the line of action, which is always the perpendicular line connecting them, so it's something like this. And that would be our perpendicular. And again, drawn a little bit more accurately, but nothing new. All right, so here we say draw the line of action for each of these uh, distinct forces using dashed lines for the using our usual convention here. So we'll do, let's say, the purple one. It means extend the force backward and forward in space. Okay, something like that. The green one would be a, a vertical line, and the blue one would be a horizontal line. So those are our lines of action for these forces. Drawn more clearly, uh, we have something like this. Given those lines of action, draw the moment arm for each force using the corresponding color. So we want the shortest distance between the pivot and the purple line, and that would be this segment perpendicular to the purple line, or the shortest distance between the pivot and the green force, and since this is the line of action for the green force. We really want this distance. That is the perpendicular distance. And we see oops, uh, right, that is our, our perpendicular for green. I guess that is our perpendicular for purple. Um, we see that life is nice because since the green was perpendicular to the thing we were rotating, uh, its line of action is simply its distance, which is nice. We'll see that those will generally be easy ones. And then we're hit, stuck with the blue one, or we're hit to the blue one. We say we want the shortest distance between this line and the pivot point. But the pivot point is on that line, so the shortest distance is zero. There is no moment arm to draw. Right? And that will tell us later on the torque is zero. Since the torque is the, the moment arm times the, the force, whatever the size of the blue force is, its torque is zero.
Here we're trying to open a door on a frictionless hinge uh, viewed from the top, and we want to know if I find the torque in Newton meters. Since we have angles to the forces, it's probably going to be easiest to use this equation, that torque is R times F perpendicular. Uh, R was given as 0.75. That's easy. F perpendicular, I hope you can convince yourself pretty quickly, is going to be F times the cosine of 20, because it's in this triangle, it's the adjacent side. So we can get that value. That force component is 225 or 226 newtons. So the torque is going to be 226 newtons times the 0.75, or 170 newton meters. You might wonder, why can't we just use the, the original force directly, the original equation, which is tau is RF sine of the angle between them, which is fine. But notice that the angle between the two is between the radial line and the force. It's not 20 degrees, it's 70 degrees. So I'd have to say 0 0.75 times 240 times the sine of 70, which is 169 in sum. We've rounded a little differently here, so we get a little sig figs contradiction between these two. But that's because how I did my rounding uh, when I found the component. All right, and this one says compute tau about point P. So we're spinning this, whatever this thing is, this little piece of plywood or whatever, we're giving it a spin around P. So all of it's moving, you know, like that and around like that, like that. Um, not that we want those anymore. And we want to find in blue the, the force, the force that has the greatest magnitude, and in red, the ones that have the least. And the way to do this will be to just do some line, lines of action. So let's say for A, for well for force A, its line of action passes through the pivot point, so its moment arm will be zero, so the torque will be zero. A will have to be the least in magnitude. There might be other things that are like that are, are that. In this case there won't be, but there could be other things like that. Uh, but A has to be among the least. I'm gonna flip over to doing um, C. For C has a line of action, which is just this horizontal line. So its moment arm is this, which is 2. So the torque here is 4 newtons times 2 boxes, whatever they are. And if I look at D, it has a line of action, which is this. And that has a moment arm, which is also 2. So C and D are the same. Uh, they're either the, I don't know if they're most or least, but they're the same. And then for B, this is the line of action. And so our moment arm is this. And we can see that because this is the hypotenuse of a triangle including that side, it's longer. And the triangle including that side, it's longer. So B has the biggest moment arm. They're all the same forces. B will end up being the largest torque. All right, torque that tends to rotate the object in a counterclockwise direction is usually considered positive, and a torque tending to rotate the object in a counterclockwise direction is usually considered negative. I say usually because you have the freedom to pick whatever axes you want or whatever reference frame you want, but the standard ones are clockwise is negative and counterclockwise is positive. So we have these three forces. They all have the same magnitude. Uh, F1 and 2 act at 45 degree angles, but F3 is horizontal. For each force, um, consider the point given and whether the torque would be clockwise or anti-clockwise or zero. Anti-clockwise being a physicist's way of saying counterclockwise. So if we talk about rotating about point A, then we can see that F1 would tend to spin this whole thing that way about point A, and that is clockwise. All right, for force two, we can see that the line of action goes through the point of rotation, so we get zero torque. And for force three, 
the live action does not go through the point of rotation, so there will be some rotation. And if I pull this way on this piece of cardboard, it's going to move that way. And so we're going to get anti-clockwise. For point B, let's get rid of these now if I can. So now point B is our axis of rotation. And we can see that um, F1 still pulls it counterclockwise. Till tends to rotate it this way. F2, which is now sort of pushing on this side, will tend to spin it that way, which is anti-clockwise. But F3 passes through the axis and so gets zero torque. And then for C, they all pass through, right? So F1's line of action passes through C, line F2's passes through 3, and so does F3's, so we get zero torque in all of them. The net torque on something is the sum of all the torques due to the applied forces, exactly like you expect North to. Uh, torque to be. Remember that torque is technically a vector, so there is a direction here, even though it's just plus or minus, you need to respect it. Um, there's also an axle, so this is the picture of a bike wheel with pedals and so on, um, and the chain exerts torques on the cog, and the pedal, of course, exerts forces on this little axis thing, whatever this is, whatever you call that. There is an axle here that is holding the, um, I guess it's called a crank, this force is holding the, the gear in place and preventing you when you push down on the crank, you don't want the gear to move down, so it, it points opposite to that. But it doesn't, since it's exerting at the axis, it doesn't affect the rotation, it exerts no torque. All right, which third force on the wheel, if apply, applied at point P, would make the net torque zero? Well, we can look here and say force, the force of, at the pivot here, whatever it is, this guy exerts no torque because, again, passes through the pivot point. And this one has a line of action like this. So we've got something like this. And so we can say it's exerting a force, a torque which is uh, positive, counterclockwise. So I need a torque that exerts um, a force which is negative or uh, clockwise. So that would not be uh, this one. Let's get rid of this that one because that would be zero torque and then if I do this one it can't be that either because that would tend to spin the wheel this way as well so we don't want that um, and then this one part uh, B can be considered something like that and something like that and this doesn't do anything and this tends to, s to rotate the thing in the wrong direction so it's either A or C but we know that it has to be smaller, it has to be bigger than uh, the existing force because it's closer in. Because we need the torques to be equal and the torque is R perpendicular F. Since we have reduced R, we have to increase F. So it has to be case A.